A little over a century ago, a shadowy figure lurked in the dark alleys of London, preying on innocent victims. His identity haunts us to this day. I'm Heather Graham. Join me as we uncover the view from hell. Don't be satisfied by this. The story of Jack the Ripper is one of the most famous unsolved murder mysteries of all time. Trying to uncover his identity has fascinated us for over a hundred years. Directed by the Hughes brothers and starring Johnny Depp, Ian Holm, Robbie Coltrane, and myself, From Hell brings a very human face to an inhumane series of events. I was always attracted to the story of Jack the Ripper. I was always fascinated with the case. For people who aren't aware of the Jack the Ripper case, they never did catch the murderer. And this movie is about five uh, prostitutes in that area who were witness to a marriage of their friend to a mysterious guy. And for some reason, their friend ends up missing and they start getting picked off one by one. It's a very kind of complicated and interesting theory about who he was and you meet a lot of characters along the way and you wonder who it is. Sometime this evening a bang tail was murdered in George Yard. That doesn't sound much heavy ordinary. It was the way she was done, Inspector. It was the way that she was done that cries out for a man of your talents. Inspector Aberline, based on a real guy, was assigned to Whitechapel to investigate the case and try and crack it and who the Ripper is. I believe this was done by someone with at least a working knowledge of dissection. Aberline has these visions and he has this kind of special gift where he has flashes of what is going to happen in his dreams. I saw a face. You know, they used to burn men like you alive. Aberline, during his investigation, meets, in fact, all the prostitutes and Mary Kelly. You're Mary Kelly, is that right? That's right. I want you and your friends off the streets until I can sort this thing out. Mary Kelly, I'm a prostitute, and I live in London in this slum called Whitechapel. Myself and all my friends are, are on the brink of starvation. We're just trying to get through the day, and different friends are being killed by Jack the Ripper. And um, I help Johnny Depp in his investigation. Uh, he becomes especially close with Mary Kelly and finds out through his investigation that she is next in line to be visited by the Ripper, and uh, it becomes more than just the investigation, it becomes uh, emotional for him. He falls in love. Your vision's about me? Mm. Most definitely. At least one of her organs was removed. Is it possible, sir, that the killer is an educated man? I must admit, if I were you, I'd look for someone with a thorough knowledge of human anatomy. Yeah. Could have been anyone. These girls might have very well known the guy. And at the same time, it could have been some major conspiracy. It's impossible to know. He's not merely killing. He's punishing them. Oh, he's out of his mind. The great thing about this movie is it's just this great mystery, and it's really smart, and it, you don't really know, you know who it is until the very end. Jack, there's no finish. <gasps> who was Jack the Ripper? A butcher, a doctor, a social miscast? There's so many theories, it's hard to separate them from the actual police work. Well, Jack the Ripper is a man, they think, that murdered five women. They haven't found him, and they never will find him. So it's still a mystery, and that's why people are still fascinated by Jack the Ripper, because they can't find the man. It's like the Titanic. It's one of those great mysteries that nobody's ever solved. Well, the Scotland Yard files on the Whitechapel murders cover 11 murders beginning in April 1888 and ending in February 1891. Now, all these murders weren't committed by the same hand. What we're looking at with Jack the Ripper, the canonical five murders committed by the Ripper were between the end of August 1888 and the 9th of November. He was, on record, the first serial killer of his kind. One day, men will look back and say that I gave birth to the 20th century. You're not going to see the 20th century. Jack the Ripper, the name came from one of the letters at the, at the time of the murders when it started getting all that press, all these letters started coming in. So Jack the Ripper, the name, first appeared in one of the letters, which most of the Ripperologists believe are all 
absolute fake. They're rubbish, you know that. Scotland Yard has something like 230 letters supposedly from Jack the Ripper, of which, ironically enough, that's where we get our title. The only one that is believed to be legitimate, which is in the British Museum today. It was a letter that uh, came with half of a human kidney, and they did believe it was from Jack, and it had the return address, which is very crucial to our film. From hell. Well, at least they got the address right. I believe this was done by an educated man, such as a doctor. An educated or... man? That's preposterous. Probably a tradesman or a butcher. Possibilities as theories as to who Jack the Ripper was uh, go uh, in all directions. There's a very famous letter called the Detective Little Child Letter, where he says they caught Jack the Ripper, and because he was a doctor, they gave him bail, thinking he would be too decent to skip bail. But he was an American doctor. He, sure enough, skipped bail, went to Paris, and ended up back in America, where, repeatedly, he continued murdering in America. And the doctor's name in that case was Dr. Tumblety. Well, one thing's for certain. An Englishman didn't do it. My own personal theory is that on the night of the double murder, we have the best clue ever, and we know that he's going into the neighborhood where they're trying to find him. He must therefore have been someone who fitted into this neighborhood, someone who didn't stand out from the crowd. Aaron Kosminski, a poor Polish Jew living in the heart of the area who was apprehended effectively in December 1888, was placed into Stepney Workhouse Infirmary, and from there he went to an asylum. There's several theories on who Jack Ripper is, and the one that's most popular is the one we chose to do, which is the, the world conspiracy, they call it. There's too many odd facts to reconcile it not being somebody of influence. For two weeks, the London police in that area were on what's called high alert. The day after what would become the final murder, the London police are taken off high alert. But did someone know there weren't gonna be any more murders? There's all kinds of facts that lead to the conclusion that there is somebody of influence. And you have other theories that deal in like an American doctor, or you have a school teacher. And there's, I, I, I suppose there'd be like 30 or 40 of them basically, you know, but you can't make all the theories in one movie. Well, that, that, that proves it. Whoever created the name Jack the Ripper was a marketing genius because you can say that name to anyone, anywhere in the world today, and it will immediately conjure up vivid images of foggy, gaslit streets and an untold horror stalking his unsuspecting prey through the back streets and alleyways of the East End of London. Whether commenting on civil unrest and menace to society, or highlighting social issues in the heist movie Dead Presidents, or theorizing about Jack the Ripper, the Hughes brothers do everything with a sense of conscience and style all their own. At a young age, I remember hearing the name Jack the Ripper and never uh, knowing who he was. I just remember that name, Ripper, like, what kind of name is that, you know? What initially caught our interest about the Jack the Ripper Legend was uh, when we were little, we saw this in search of episode with Leonard Nimoy where they, they chronicle a lot of things, but this episode was about Jack the Ripper and it like scared us. And I just remember it stuck in our head, the fog and all that, the cape and the knife and the women. And like everyone, we always had like a fascination with it, kind of like the JFK situation where it was never solved. He didn't finish. He won't be satisfied by this. One of the interviewers asked the Hughes brothers, they said, you know, well, why are you guys you from the street doing this period English piece? You guys are American, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, did Steven Spielberg need to hang out with aliens in order to make E.T.? You know, he's like, we're doing a film about street violence, and that's what our other films have been about. This film fits into the same style of film we like to make because it deals with violence, and you deal with the streets, it's a whole set of different rules. But when you're talking about a 20th century ghetto and then, you know, 19th century ghetto, they're both pretty similar in a way, just without the same tools. You know, there's, there's knives instead of guns. <laughs> the background yeah. and action. There's more than one then. There was always that thing inside my head going, well, how does this work, you know? One guy come over and say, you know, do this, you know, the other guy comes over and, you know, contradicts him completely, will it, will it be like that? But no, in fact, their process, it's really terrific, and they, they, you know, they've got it down. Beautifully. Me and my brother both work in separate areas while we're on the set. He deals with the actors in rehearsal and on the set. And I deal with the camera and the techno side and setting up shots and color palettes. But then we both blur the lines and you might have ideas on shots. I might have ideas on performance and stuff like that. They're so fun and they just, they're so well prepared and everything's so well thought out that, that when they come to work they're just incredibly relaxed and love to hang out and play music all the time. If you can come to the set and be, you know, clown around, be relaxed, play music, 
socialize with everybody. I think everybody gets relaxed, and I think the best comes out of that. I think they're bringing to the movie like a real rawness, you know, instead of this very overly precious period feeling. I think they are bringing like a raw, emotional, passionate, exciting take. Good. The key to any investigation is attention to detail. And from hell, no detail was too small for the Hughes brothers, who used actual case evidence to recreate Ripper's settings and murders. What was really impressive about it is that the Hughes brothers, Alan and Albert, were really, really, really sticklers for detail and to the truth, you know. The, the exact position of the body, the exact position of this window here, where the window was broken in Miller's Court. I mean, down to the cobblestones, those guys were here like, oh no, that's wrong, that's wrong, look at the picture. When we sat with Martin Childs, a production designer, and talked about building the Whitechapel sets, we looked at historical photos, looked at the past movies too, and different movies in this time period, and also went on the, the tour of the real Ripper murder sites. The big undertaking for this was that we had to reproduce Whitechapel, we had to produce the East End of London. And had we shot this in the UK, if you go there now, a lot of buildings still exist, but you can't turn around and shoot the reverse of them. So what we did here was create something where you could shoot 360 degrees of, of Victorian London. The actual victims actually walked up and down this street and uh, we created the church and the pub, and they, they still exist to this day in London. It's the only two pieces that really stayed intact. Our set was so big that it's like the sets of the 30s and the 40s of big epic movies. You can't build that kind of set anymore because it's literally a whole back lot into of itself just for one film. He's taken at least one of the rulings. This ain't killing for profit. This is ritual. <laughs> We did a lot of research actually for this film. So we had documentaries, talked to researchers and ripperologists, what they call them, guys that are really into the whole ripper mythology. A lot of work has been done, a lot of research by the directors and the uh, art design people into the actual scenes of the murders. They've looked at the victim photographs to get the injuries exactly right. I think this is going to make for a very interesting movie. All of the murder sites are well documented and we've reproduced those to the nth degree, really. Some of the murders you can actually obtain photos and see a lot of what, what was around the bodies, you know, and, and how they were found. Some of them, they have less material on, but we had to connect the dots or go find police records and read the descriptions, you know, and, and paint in everything there and use these ripperologists that actually also to, to help us. The body positions are pretty accurate, and then um, the, the cuts on all the victims are exactly the same as the victims from 100 years ago. The murders were so horrific. They've, they've recreated them for the film, and, and we've walked on the set, Johnny and I, and gone, oh my God, not being able to look at them. Fetch the ambulance. It was fun looking at them for the first time, like when they built the prosthetic bodies, because nobody's had a chance to see the damage he did to these victims. And then you see the progression of how badly mutilated they get by the end, and how much more crazy he gets along the way. Hell, Natalie, we are in hell. From Hell takes a look in one of crime's darkest minds. Whatever your theory, one thing's for sure. It's a hell of a story.